Go Church Online. Thank you so much for joining us for worship. So glad you could be here with us. Remember, if you're a visitor with us over here in the comment section, we have a place where you can fill out a comment card, a connections card. Also, if you have a prayer request, make sure you fill that out as well. We'd love to pray for you. Once again, thank you so much for joining us and have a great worship service. Darkness 
face I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil My anchor holds within the veil before the Sanhedrin for healing a man who could not walk. And this is how Peter responded to their accusation. Peter said, know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the, co the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Throughout history, the concept of a cornerstone was understood by any builder. This is the first stone that was laid to find the foundation, the measurements, and the overall structure of the building. Have you ever realized that Jesus is our cornerstone in the gospel, in the way he died on the cross? He showed us a love. He set the measurements. He set how we should love, how we should imitate. And when he, when he rose again, he set the hope for our resurrection in him. So in, in every way, Christ is the cornerstone. I cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds, his hands, his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears They laid Him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing.
break of dawn the sun of heaven rose again oh trample death where is your sting the angels roar for Christ the King yeah oh praise the name of the Lord our God oh praise his name forevermore for endless days we will sing your praise oh Lord oh Lord our God shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfix on Jesus face oh praise the name of the Lord our God oh praise his name sing your praise for how you died on the cross for us, for how you rose again, for how we will rise again with you, and how you will come back. Lord, this is the gospel. This is what we believe. Thank you for all those that are here today as we gather to listen to what you would say. And I pray that we would do just that as the sermon is preached, that we would listen to what you would say to us. Amen. All right, well, we're just going to jump straight into the text that we've been studying from the Sermon on the Mount and the somewhat difficult section which we started working on a couple weeks ago. So Matthew 5, from verse 27, where Jesus continues to speak truth as he preaches to the crowd on the hillside with these words. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It was said, whoever sends his wife away Let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be, yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. Last time we were only able to cover through verse 30. And the reason I'm taking this passage all together in two sermons is that it all hovers around the same topic, that being faithfulness. That's what this section is about. 
that if we're to be like Christ, we will need to be a faithful people. At first, Jesus talks about faithfulness in marriage, faithfulness with our eyes and in our hearts. But the last several verses are about being faithful with our mouths by saying what we mean and meaning what we say. And why would faithfulness be such a big deal for followers of Jesus? In reality, three of the six laws Jesus brings up for discussion in this sermon, at this part of his Sermon on the Mount, are about being faithful. Keeping our word, keeping our promises, staying true to our vows, being faithful. But why is Jesus so concerned that his disciples keep their promises? Why is faithfulness so important that you might even need to figure out a way to stay married to someone you no longer like? Why is it so important that you, could, you should make sure to never say one thing and then do another? Why is it so important that as a believer you should always keep your promises? Well, you see, when a person who claims to follow Jesus breaks his promise or does not keep his or her word, what does that say to people about the one he or she claims to follow? It says to them that maybe he is unfaithful as well. Are you not less likely to put your trust in the God of an unfaithful person? Wonder why we're seeing less people come to Jesus in this country over the last 50 years. The unfaithfulness of many Christians may be one of the reasons. Listen, unfaithfulness is a disease, and it comes with real consequences. How many grown kids of divorced parents have trust issues with God? How many stay away from the church because of the unfaithfulness of church people? And even because they've heard of the unfaithfulness of pastors or priests? How many unfaithful Christians have been a stumbling block for those who might have otherwise placed their faith in God. What is the cumulative effect of the unfaithfulness of Christ followers on this planet? I do not think we would want to know. Now I realize we don't claim to be perfect. I realize we can say, well, please don't judge Jesus by the behaviors of those who claim to follow him, but the fact is that is exactly what they're going to do. And so as his ambassadors, we cannot underestimate the impact of our unfaithfulness. We do well to recommit ourselves to being faithful, and specifically today, we do well to recommit ourselves to keeping promises. Think about this. If you truly believe the promise of Christ that salvation comes through faith in Him, then you will be saved at the moment you believe it, because as you truly believe it, you will receive that gift of grace. And so it really is true at the most basic level that if a person believes what God has said in the gospel, he or she will be saved. That being the case, how important is it that we who claim to follow Christ represent him as someone who can be believed? Why would they believe him if they cannot believe those who would share with them his promise? See, when we are untrustworthy as Christians, it makes Jesus seem untrustworthy to others. On the other hand, when we as his disciples keep our promises and our word, this is one of the greatest ways we can testify to the faithfulness of Christ. When we keep our promises, we honor the promise keeper. And in so doing, we give people reason to hope that he really is who he says he is. So remembering that big picture, let's review and then we'll get on with the rest of the text that we did not cover last time. Jesus is speaking with conviction and he's calling on his hillside learners to be different. To come out from among the crowd and keep their promises at a whole other level, starting with marriage. More than anything, Jesus wants his followers to be faithful. Picture Jesus as he speaks. He looks out and he sees this crowd full of everyone from rebels to homemakers to religious rich guys. And he recognizes in many of them a disease that needs to be cured. Yes, it is at least as bad as a disease. We can see this in his words, which are really quite harsh. 
He assumes the folks are going to hell if they can't get cured. That's pretty harsh. The disease Jesus sees in us here is unfaithfulness. Thinking in this way, we can find at least three different diagnoses in this passage. The first we called the last time, diagnosis was number one, ocular unfaithfulitis. This is also known as lust. And we defined it as receiving extramarital sexual pleasure through the eyes. Jesus outlines this problem in verse 28. And here's the primary symptom. The patient has a tendency to look around for visual sexual stimuli. If you have the symptom, you have the disease. The prognosis is not good. Left unchecked, this condition will lead to a loss of attraction level and sexual fulfillment from current spouse. The patient is likely to experience a downward spiral of sexual immorality, including pornography, potentially worse unless treatment is successful. Thankfully, there are treatment options. The patient will need to choose. Either eye removal or physical therapy. Assuming you would choose physical therapy, there are three facets to your treatment, and these tools come from a book called Every Man's Battle. First, we need to retrain our vision by learning a certain technique called bouncing the eyes. If you'll recall, this means looking away immediately whenever you are tempted toward lustful thoughts. Second facet of our therapy would be starving the eyes. This means that in refusing to take sexual pleasure through the eyes from, another other, from anyone other than your spouse, he or she begins to look better and better until all your needs are met in him or her. And number three, taking up your sword. This is a reverence to the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the Bible. Those who are serious about winning these battles need to have Scripture memorized. I gave the example of Job 31.1, which says, I have made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully upon a young woman. The idea is that you would quote this scripture to the enemy, to the devil, to the tempter, whenever temptation comes, wielding it as your offensive weapon with which to fight back valiantly. Now, the second diagnosis we discerned from Jesus' sermon last time is that of cardio unfaithfulitis. Here's the primary symptom. The patient allows romantic feelings toward a specific person other than his or her spouse to continue. We found the diagnosis at the end of verse 28 from the phrase, in his heart. Here's the prognosis. Left unchecked, this condition will undoubtedly lead to an extramarital affair, likely resulting in the destruction of his or her marriage, including much harm to other family and friends. The Bible offers only one treatment option for this disease, which is simply this, run away. As the Apostle Paul put it, run away from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. I told you the Greek word for run away is phugo. P-H-E-U-G-O in our letters. Phugo. So just remember you can't have an affair if you go. <laughs> Flee. Get out of there. Cut off all contact. Run away. All right, so that's our review. If you didn't hear that message, don't judge it by the minimalistic review I just shared. Go back and listen to it. I've heard from several that they found a lot of help there. Now let's go on to the next thing Jesus said in his sermon. From verse 31, Jesus continues. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her co commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say you make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. Okay, in this part... Jesus addresses the third manifestation of the disease of unfaithfulness, which we'll call oral. You've got to stay in keeping with ocular, cardio, oral, unfaithfulitis. Isn't it interesting that in life we mostly have problems with our eyes, our hearts, and our mouths? Jesus knew that. 
The primary symptom of oral unfaithfulitis could be described as follows. Patient repeatedly fails to keep commitments and promises. Based on the context of what Jesus said, that's, that's the kind of unfaithfulness he was talking about. Fails to keep commitments and promises. Here's the prognosis. Left unchecked, this condition will lead to the death of every healthy relationship resulting in loneliness and isolation. And here's the prescribed treatment. Make less promises <laughs> and keep the ones you make. I really believe that sums up what Jesus is saying. Make less promises and keep the ones you make. Now, Jesus deals first with marital vows, which themselves are oral promises made before witnesses. Just did a wedding last night, beautiful wedding. And they made promises to each other in front of witnesses verbally. But then he mentions any other verbal commitments we make, including the simple trustworthiness of what we say with our mouths in any situation. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, says Jesus. When it comes to the specific application of keeping marriage vows, I'll not be able to cover this uh, extensively today. When I preach through uh, the book of Malachi, as I've done before, I, I cover divorce in more detail. But today I'll only touch on it because in reality, Jesus was not mostly trying to unpack everything God would have to say about divorce here. The point of this passage is in dealing with the problem of unfaithfulness in general. Jesus mentions divorce as an illustration but he does not intend to expound on everything God has to say about divorce, and that's important to understand. This is far from all that the Bible says about divorce. There's actually probably a lot more than you realize. Jesus is talking about how important it is for his followers to be faithful, and obviously that includes marriage. Having said that, let me touch on the topic of divorce briefly. The foremost earthly commitment that most of us make is the commitment to a husband or wife. In fact, ever since Adam and Eve were brought together by God in the Garden of Eden, the marital commitment has been foundational to every other human relationship. Why? Because every single one of us came from a mom and a dad. And guess what? With mom, when mom and dad, uh, who, who in a way God used to make us, when mom and dad are no longer together, it winds up making it pretty tough on the kids and everyone else who's close to the family. See, if such a foundational commitment can be broken, the foundational commitment of society, if it can be broken, who or what is to be trusted? I'm not here to bash divorced people. And every story is unique. But surely we all know that divorce is not generally a good thing. And that when followers of Christ are divorced, it does not represent Jesus well to the world, particularly in the area of his faithfulness. So for just a moment, let's focus in on what Jesus said in verses 31 and 32. Quoting Moses, Jesus brings up another law. Verse 31, it was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. All right, there's some very important things we need to comprehend about these challenging verses. Remember, with biblical interpretation, it's important to understand the historical context. We need to know what Jesus was trying to communicate to his original audience, because that will be the same thing he wants to communicate to us. Understand that all preachers preach to some degree in reaction to the situation on the ground. Which means that if you don't know what that situation was, and you quote that preacher, you may well be taking him out of context and misunderstanding his intentions. This happens all the time. <laughs> and at the least, we need to make sure we don't do it to Jesus. So first of all, understand that in the Jewish community at that time, divorce was running rampant because of the liberal teachings of some popular rabbis. Jesus was countering their teachings in no uncertain terms. Remember, the people typically chose to live under the yoke. I taught you about this a few weeks ago. They typically would choose a particular rabbi and, and commit to his yoke. They would live under the yoke of one rabbi. That means they submitted themselves to his biblical interpretations, kind of almost like denominations today. All rabbis pretty much agreed on the essentials, but something like divorce was a sticking point. One famous rabbi, in particular Rabbi Hillel, was teaching that God's word gave permission for divorce for almost any reason at all. Rabbi Hillel and others used what Moses wrote 
way back in Deuteronomy 24, to justify divorce on demand. Moses wrote, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house, and she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. And if the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house, and it just goes on like that for a long time, okay? I'm going to stop there. But if you look at that passage, you will realize that the purpose of this law was not to make a statement about whether divorce is right or wrong, but to say, if you're going to do it anyway, then you need to do it in such and such a way. It's almost like saying, if you're going to steal, at least don't kill anybody when you do it. See, Moses was addressing a serious problem during his time, which was occurring among the people he was called to lead. And this is what was happening. Men were divorcing their wives and leaving them in a destitute situation. And Moses was trying to take care of the, the ladies here that were, were in this situation. Women in that culture are not allowed to um, get a divorce, only men. I'm not saying that's right, of course, but that's the way it was at that point in history. And so men were divorcing their wives, but they weren't doing anything official about it. In other words, they just were kicking them out of their house on a whim, which of course is horrific. But worse, in that time period, a woman might have starved to death if she couldn't find someone to help her. There was simply not a way for an isolated woman to earn a living in the ancient Jewish culture. Now, God had a system and a prescription for women to be taken care of because God loves women. But these sinful men were messing that system totally up. <clears throat> They were messing it up. Widows were, according to God, to be taken care of by certain male relatives, kinsmen, redeemers, they were called. Young girls would be taken care of their, by their fathers. Um, there was a system to take care of all women except this group that were being kicked out of the home by their husbands. It wasn't set up to take care of them because divorce wasn't really supposed to happen. And so Moses was like, well, you got a mess. i gotta, I got to do something about this. Thinking of these mistreated woman, women, he was trying to fix that problem. He said, if you losers are going to divorce your wife, you must at least give her a certificate of divorce so that she can be remarried and therefore brought back into the community. Fast forward a couple millennia. And we've got Rabbi Hillel and others uh, taking this passage and saying, sure, just give her a piece of paper so everyone knows about it. And then otherwise go for it. God doesn't care. And that misinterpretation of Scripture was what Jesus was coming up against in our passage today, and that's why he was so strong about it. He was reacting to divorce on demand by saying, look, you were never supposed to be getting divorced in the first place because it makes God look bad. At another time, Jesus was asked about this issue directly. We have it recorded in Matthew 19. And in response to the question, Jesus went back even further than Deuteronomy 24, or the passage Rabbi Hillel and others were using. Jesus went back to the first two chapters of Genesis. Here's how it played out. Genesis, or, uh, Jesus went back to Genesis, but it's recorded. This, this scenario, this scene, this conversation is recorded in Matthew 19. It says, some Pharisees come and tried to trap him with, with this question, should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for any reason? Haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus replied. Here's where he quotes Genesis. They record that from the beginning God made them male and female, and he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one separate them, for God has joined them together. Then why did Moses say a man could merely write an official letter of divorce and send her away? They asked. Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce as a concession for your hard-hearted wickedness, but it was not what God had originally intended. And I tell you this, a man who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery unless his wife has been unfaithful. Jesus' disciples then said to him, then it is better not to marry. That's just how screwed up the men were in their understanding of marriage. By the way, Jesus was countercultural when it came to women. He was awesome with women. He was criticized for how well he treated women by the chauvinists, who apparently included his disciples at first, because here they say, if divorce isn't an option, then we'd rather not take the chance to marry a woman at all. They were all messed up in the head because of wrong teaching. It was a case of bad biblical interpretation 
which had led, an un, led to an ungodly cultural norm even among God's people. Of course, that never happens today. Make note of this. Just because something is recorded as an occurrence in the Bible does not mean that God was all for it. In Deuteronomy 24, Moses was giving instructions on divorce, not trying to justify it or say it was okay with God. By the time of Jesus, at least some of the rabbis were misinterpreting Moses, and this led to an entire uh, cultural misstep. So Jesus needed to straighten it out. And that's what he did, even if it was only a side point in our text today. So where does this leave us on the issue of divorce? Well, for one thing, Jesus gave the exception of unchastity, right? We see that in verse 32 of our text. Jesus allows for divorce in the case of unchastity. And I'll tell you that I think that it does hold over the next phrase, that in the case of unchastity, it would be okay to remarry. But he does. He gives the exception of unchastity. Jesus allows for divorce in this one reason. In the Greek word, there is pornea, translated as unchastity. Pornea, P-O-R-N-E-A. And while this literally means sexual immorality, the context is all about adultery. And so we need to realize that this is, this is about sexual immorality of an unfaithful nature. And so while unchastity can be a broader term than adultery, in this context, adultery or marital unfaithfulness is the idea. And that's a solid translation. I'll put it this way. Unchastity here means sexual immorality of an unfaithful nature. But if we were to look at what uh, the rest of the Bible says about divorce, we would find that even if there is unchastity, that doesn't mean divorce is a good thing or that God wouldn't prefer that the couple try their best to work it out. The fact is that God is never fond of divorce. As it is recorded in Malachi 2.16, I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. The Bible also says, give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. So here's what Jesus is saying in his sermon. If you don't have this biblical grounds for divorce, unchastity, sexual immorality of an unfaithful nature, then you should not be getting a divorce at all. Because doing so is breaking your promise and now you are the one being unfaithful. You're being unfaithful, and you're ultimately causing your spouse to be unfaithful through divorce. And again, unfaithfulness does not represent Christ's will to the world. Now, as mentioned, I'm not going to dig down into the intricacies of divorce today, but I will say that the subject is complicated, and those who want to say it is not complicated are either naive or calloused of heart. Catchphrases and easily stated absolutes do not truly cover the issue. Some of you won't like this, but there really are times when divorce is the lesser of two evils. It's a reality I did not learn in ministerial academia, but rather in actual ministry. Jesus was not trying to give a one-sentence treatise on divorce here to be nailed down on an absolute. Beyond that, Jesus was talking to a Jewish audience. He had their issues in mind, the issue of the day. Not every issue that might happen someday, somewhere on this planet, in every culture. For example, if your husband turns out to be a criminally insane mass murderer, I think you're probably safe to divorce him regardless of whether or not he has been unchaste. Jesus was giving an illustration about the disease of unfaithfulness. I'm not trying to sum up all that the Bible has to say about divorce. If you still don't believe that there could be possibly be other grounds that come out somewhere in Scripture, note that even Paul said that if an unbelieving spouse wishes to divorce you, you should let them go. And there are other nuances in Scripture to be considered, such as what happened in the time of Ezra. You can check that out. Again, this statement from Jesus is simply not comprehensive. Remember, Jesus is doing two things, trying to do two things at this point in his sermon. First, he's showing us that we cannot obey the law of God well enough to get into heaven that way. And second, he's giving us instructions on how to follow him and how to best represent him as believers. Focusing the lens out even further, 
Jesus is showing his followers how to bring the kingdom of heaven down to earth. And folks, we don't do that by divorcing each other. Suffice it to say that divorce is bad and a last resort. And when I say last, I mean probably three levels beyond what most people think of as last. And that's what's important here. Jesus is teaching those who claim to be his followers to be faithful as he is faithful, to hold to our vows, to keep our promises, to represent the God of faithfulness by being faithful, even if others are not faithful, just as he's faithful to us even when we're not faithful to him. That's the spirit of what Jesus is saying at this point in his sermon. Now, what about bad decisions made in the past? What if you already got a divorce, and what if maybe you shouldn't have? Well, Repent if needed and move forward in grace. Some things cannot be undone. And if so, just like all of us in one area or another, you'll have to move forward as a forgiven sinner. When I look at the Bible, I see a lot about redemption and moving on from the past and not letting former sins keep us in bondage. God is in the redemption business. But there's one other nuance here that I don't want you to miss. Why is unchastity the exception, according to Jesus here? Why is basically adultery or being unfaithful by engaging in sexual activity with another person outside of the marriage the exception that would allow for divorce? It is because sex is the act of marriage. This is the reason God created sex, for marriage, between one man and and one woman. Physical intercourse is the consummation of a marital covenant between one man and one woman who are committed for life. And the truth is that in a biblical sense, you could very easily say that to have sex with someone is to marry that person. Wow. What does the Bible say about the first marriages? What does it say about the marriage of Adam and Eve? It says Adam went into his wife and they became one flesh. That right there is basically a description of the first wedding. The first marriage. Repeating vows and covenantal ceremonies came later. But if you read your Bible, you will see that when a man joined with a woman at that moment, the two became man and wife. Early on, it was as simple as that. Get this straight, young people. In the Bible, sex was the commitment. You didn't just have sex and then say, see you later. You didn't hook up. If there was sex, there was a lifelong commitment. That's why sex outside of marriage is wrong. In God's eyes, when two become one, they're married. So what happens when they split up? It's basically like divorce. God hates divorce. So why is it wrong to live with someone first to see if marriage is a good idea? Well, it's wrong because in God's eyes, sex is a lifelong commitment in and of itself. <clears throat> the two have become one. He joined them together. So you ask, why even bother formally getting married if sex has already happened? Here's the answer. Our culture, and probably you if you're honest, have separated sex from marriage. And God says that's wrong. If you've already had sex with the person you want to marry, then you need to make a covenant together to stay together for life, which is biblical. And you do that in order to reverse what has been done improperly. Similarly, if you're not willing to make lifelong vows to each other, then your sexual activity is unchastity at the moment against the person whom you will marry someday. And it is unchastity because it is not part of a lifelong one flesh commitment. Jesus said unchastity is grounds for divorce. So what if your marriage starts off with unchastity in the first place? I'd say that means you're starting on pretty shaky ground. My suggestion, repentance. And that means abstinence from this point forward until you make your vows and commit to each other for life. And if you aren't even sure you want to get married, that's all the more reason to stop acting before God as if you are married. Now back to the disease of unfaithfulness. And today we're mostly talking about oral or verbal unfaithfulitis. We talked about this in terms of the promises of marriage. But continuing to call his followers to faithfulness Jesus brings up another Old Testament law to make a similar point. Let's read it again. Verse 33, Jesus says, Again, you've heard that the ancients were told, You shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, 
or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. When I was a kid, if we wanted to convince someone that we were telling the truth, we would say, cross my heart and hope to die if I tell a lie. Someone wanting to be extra convincing might even add, and stick a needle in my eye. (laughs) Or maybe when we were a little older, we might say, I swear on a stack of Bibles. Or maybe, honest to God. Or as God is my witness. Someone else might say, God knows I'm telling the truth. Well, why would we ever feel the need to say any of those things? By saying those things, are we not betraying ourselves as those who might not always tell the truth? And isn't it particularly brazen to use God's name to try to convince someone of our truthfulness in any given situation? I do think it better, I'll be better off taking Jesus at his word on this and doing away with those phrases. But there's much more here than that quick and easy application. This is one of those spots where a first century Jew understood what Jesus said in a whole other way than we do without a little bit of research. Again, historical context is important. Let's talk about some key facts. First, note that Jesus has now moved away from the Ten Commandments and is addressing a lesser known law, first outlined in Leviticus and repeated with some elaboration in the book of Numbers. Let's actually read both of those. From Leviticus, you shall not swear falsely by my name so as to profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. And then from Numbers, if a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Now, by the time of Jesus, these laws had become an entire casuistry. Most of you are probably thinking, what the heck is that? Well, the casuistry was a lengthy and elaborate system of laws wherein one law was based upon another until you very well might wind up with a bad law. Just think of the United States tax code (laughs) for an example. The religious leaders were afraid of the consequences of breaking the original law, so they had created a system of more laws to keep people from ever even getting close to breaking the original law. The casuistry, which developed around the laws I read a moment ago, basically wound up meaning that nobody would ever swear by God or take an oath in His name ever, but rather to swear their oaths by other things. That way, if they did not keep their oath, the consequences were less. And so what had started out as a simple admonition from God for people to keep their word was now a legalistic morass of nonsense, and Jesus says, enough! Just let your yes be yes and your no be no, you religious nutheads. Looking back to the text, the references Jesus makes to heaven or the earth or Jerusalem or your head are specifically prescribed in the rabbinical code to which he refers. Understand, Jesus is not pulling these potential ways to take an oath out of thin air but he was referring to specific rules for oath-taking which were outlined in the Mishnah, more or less a commentary on Scripture written and continually updated by the rabbis of the day. In those writings, there is sort of a, a hierarchy in terms of how binding an oath was or what the consequences would be if an oath were broken depending on just how close a person got to swearing by God. And so even though the original law recording, recorded in Leviticus and Numbers is about keeping oaths made uh, in God's name, now they were actually taught to swear by something short of God in order to protect themselves in case they broke their vows or spoke falsely. But Jesus is, is pointing out that all of those other things, Jerusalem, your head, all the other things by which they're, they're swearing are still related to God anyway. And basically that to swear falsely or to abandon a vow is just as wrong regardless of whether that vow was taken in the name of God or by any of the other things. Matthew records that Jesus addressed this issue even more emphatically in chapter 23, verses 16 through 22. So obviously this is important to Jesus, and therefore we know it's important to God. Again, this is one of the things Jesus came down to earth to tell us. And in the discourse recorded in Matthew 23, Jesus actually referred to those who were teaching this system as blind fools. I said religious nut jobs. Blind fools is what Jesus called them. Now, I mentioned the Mishnah, 
where this system of oaths was recorded. And get this, to the people of Jesus' time, the Mishnah had about the same authority as the Bible. So what was Jesus doing here at a deeper level? He was basically saying, look, if it ain't in the Bible, it's bunk. He was defying all the other rabbis and telling the people that they had been duped into a man-made religion of legalism, which was actually keeping them from God and God's intentions for them. Notice his final conclusion on the subject, the last phrase in our text, anything beyond these is of evil. Jesus is saying that this legalistic system of oath-taking, which they have been taught by blind fools, is not of God, but is of evil. Jesus proclaimed liberty to the captives. He was freeing the people from empty religion and showing them that Yahweh is not the legalistic rule maker they thought he was. His yoke was actually easy and his burden was light. They didn't need to remember or understand all kinds of rules, but they did need to actually be honest. It was not a matter of swearing by the right thing, but a matter of simply keeping one's word. And yet again in this we see that we will not be able to achieve God's perfect standard. No matter how far the religious leaders went to try to define exactly what to do or not to do, they would never do any of it well enough to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying they will do better if they will simply go back to what God said in the first place and there, recognizing their own failure and sin to repent. So you don't repent. This is such lessons for us in religion today. You don't repent if you create a system you think you're able to follow. You repent if you look into God's perfect law. And that's where you see your sin. And that's where you seek God's help, the Savior. And help to become a person of obedience, someone who has been brought into step with the spirit of God's law and who he is. The spirit of God's law is to be like Christ. Beyond this, as forgiven sinners saved by grace, we now have the presence of the Holy Spirit who helps us obey God in such a way as to represent him well to a lost world in need of a Savior. In other words, Jesus was preaching the gospel on the mountain that day. And as such, he was tearing down the religious system of legalism. But in the modern church, we're never guilty of repeating this history of legalism. Right? That's sarcasm. Wrong. I'm afraid that we have our own casuistries, whether written down or not. We have our own rules within rules, our own commentaries, our own lists of do's and don'ts. Like them, we will always do better when we go back to what God actually said and keeping it pure and simple, return to God in repentance as we see our sin and find the power in Christ to obey. Jesus said we're to teach people His commands. That's why the ultimate thing to do as his disciples is just what we're doing, to look at how Jesus interpreted and defined the law in such places as this. And what did Jesus say? He said, look, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. In other words, Jesus said, be faithful with your mouth. Even as God is faithful with his, keep your promises just as God keeps his promises. So let's get real. You keep your word. Is your yes really a yes? Or is your yes sometimes really a no? You say no to something you should say no to only to break down later and actually make it a yes in the end? Are you a yes man to someone's face but then a no man behind his back? Is your yes yes and your no no? I don't know where it comes from but we've all heard the phrase a person is only as good as their word. I do believe that is about true. If a person cannot be trusted, then what? Jesus called for trustworthiness from anyone who claims to follow him. The disciples of Jesus must mean what they say and say what they mean. We must keep our promises and commitments. Why so important? Because Jesus charged his followers to go out and make disciples. We are to go out into the world and help people know who God is and how they can come to him through Christ. What kind of God do we show them when we're unfaithful? 
Think about the seriousness of this. Seriousness of this. Romans 10 makes our responsibility clear. How will they know unless we show them? That's what it says in Romans 10. We're called to be as ambassadors to a lost world. If the only Christ they ever see is the Christ in you, what kind of Christ will he be? An unfaithful one? I hope not. Jesus says, keep your word. Keep your commitments. Keep your promises. Even when it's hard, even when it hurts, even when it doesn't make sense sometimes. It's important. So what if you would have to admit to a bit of oral unfaithfulitis? Well, first of all, repent. That means to confess your sin to God and make a commitment to go in a new direction. For the new direction, look back at what I said is the treatment for this disease, which comes straight from the words of Jesus. Make less promises and keep the ones you make. <clears throat> you can become a more Christ-like person by keeping one promise and one commitment at a time. I recommend starting with your marriage, if you're married, your vows to your husband or wife. I might add that if you joined this church and became a member, that was a commitment, and there were some spe specific things that you committed to. Uh, are, you, are you keeping those? And you can probably think of other examples. Faithful people represent the God of faithfulness. I, I just think that faithfulness is probably, I think it's hard to say what's the most important thing about God, right? But I think we could just about make the case that faithfulness would be the most important thing that you could know about God. How else can we have any hope? You know, I mean, we stand on his promises. Our faith really is in, not faith, our faith isn't in our own faith. Our faith is in the faithfulness of God. It's like the old hymn says. I was just going to say it, but why not sing it? Right? You can sing with me if you want. Great is thy faithfulness. O oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not. As Thou hast been, Thou forever wilt be. Great is Thy faithfulness. Great is Thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hands hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. If you would testify to the faithfulness of God, give me a hearty amen. amen. He is faithful. He is faithful. You know, as I close uh, this, this out, um, it's kind of a heady message, you know. I mean, we, I just, I could feel that as we're going along. This is, this is a very, very um, um, cerebral kind of a message. And so some of you, I may, even some of you are cross-eyed right now, I imagine. It was just one of those sermons. But um, before, I, before I'm done, I just want to, real quick, I mentioned... Jesus preached the gospel that day on, on, the, on the sermon on, on, from, the, from that hillside. Well, what's the gospel? Well, in the, in the biggest picture, the gospel is that God is faithful. We're not, but he's made a way uh, for us to be forgiven and to be brought into his kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. So Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom, but the specifics came out a little later when he died on the cross and rose again. The specific way that God saves us is that he died for our sins. He gave it all. There was no one else who could do it, so he did it himself. 
Um, and he came in the flesh and died on a cross for our sin. He bled and died, paid the price, took, took the justice, took the punishment, paid the price for our sin. And then if we will just receive what he's already done for us by faith, because you have to believe in what he did and in who he is to, 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 to really receive that gift. You know, if I'm trying to hold, hand you a gift right now, I want to give Bevan my phone and he doesn't even believe I'm really here or that I, he doesn't believe that I have a phone or he doesn't believe that this phone is anything he would really want to have. He's just going to look at me funny. It's maybe someday. But if he understands that this phone, it means he gets to be in heaven, that it's going to be forgiven for all his sin and everything else, I think he'd probably take it. That's what, that's the faith is the faith to receive it. The faith is to say, yes, God, you did it all. And now I would like that to be applied to me, please. Yes, thank you. That's really all it is. That's what we mean about salvation is receiving the gospel, receiving the good news that, that Jesus already paid it all on the cross. And so uh, most Sundays we try to give people an opportunity that have never understood that or never received that to do so. Now, at least in this point in our history, we don't do anything like make you stand up or raise your hand or come to the front or, uh, you know, on day one. I mean, you're supposed to be baptized after that. That does take a little bit of a little bit of guts. But today we don't have any water. So all I'm asking you to do is make a decision and you can just say a prayer to God and say, yes, and this is the day I want to receive that gift. And um, most of us have a testimony. Many of us have a testimony of when that happened. For me, I was six years old, which is young, younger than most. But I understood it then, and that's when I received it. My, my, my wife was, I think, 17 uh, when she had that moment. But what about you? When was that moment for you? Have, have you had a moment where you received the gift? Or is God just still holding out the phone, and you're sort of like, you know, holding out Christ, and you're sort of like, I believe you're there, and I believe that, that he died on that cross, but I'll get around to doing something with it later. Have you ever put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ? You can do that today. So if you would, just bow your heads with me and just, just think for a minute about the cross. And just, all of us, just, just thank God for that. Just thank God for what Jesus did there. How he took the justice. How he paid the price so that we wouldn't have to. And then if, if you're one who really can't really think of a time when you've ever received it, maybe it's today. Just, just say yes. Let your yes be yes this morning. Say, yes, God, I want to receive your promise. I believe your promise. I believe you're faithful, even though I'm not. And I'm putting my trust in, in your way of salvation, in Jesus on the cross, and that he rose again. I'm just going to put my trust in that gospel, in what you're offering, in your promise, that you'll save me if I will accept it. I just put my trust in you today and in Jesus. And Lord, I thank you that you've already done the hard part. Forgive me of all of my sin. Help me to learn to follow Jesus. But today, I just want to take the first step and I'm saying yes. My yes is yes today. I want to follow Jesus. I want him to be my Savior. In his name. Amen. You are the love that frees us. You are the light that leads us. Like a fire burning. Son of God, you are the one. You are the one.